on further to the ankle session i would request dr amit to kindly continue with the presentation thank you sir good, good afternoon everyone <clears throat> i think my job is very simple now i have just 15 in the next 15 minutes what i'll try to do is finish whatever has not been covered as of now and my main focus will be on the rotator cuff and then we also had uh, dr garun's lecture we talked in detail about instability as well as anatomy so what i will do is let's focus only on the rotator cuff which is our main area of interest apart from some pathological cases of the labrum so <clears throat> basically why does a patient comes for a mri so and when does a patient go for a ultrasound i always a dilemma as to even for radiologists to understand what is to be done when so as we see the cases we will go step by step and understand that Uh, usual indications for mri is pain without trauma or it could be trauma causing some limitation of movement or it could be instability dislocation or infection tumor and follow up of cases so these are the basic standard reasons why a patient comes for mri the most important thing first what we need to do here is uh, apart from what we saw in the anatomy is i would i what i did is skipped few of the slides so as to focus on only those conditions which have not been covered so one thing i would like to focus on is on the shape of the acromion and this is which is something which you can easily do on a sagittal mri image and on the coronal mri image you can clearly look at the sh shape of the acromion on the coronal images that whether there is horizontal like in this case or it is low lying as in this case or it is inferolateral why it is important is this inferolateral acromion and an acromion which is hook shape or a convex inferior margins are the ones which are most likely to cause impingement so if you see this acromion this is relatively okay on the uh, sagittal plane and if you see this one also this is relatively okay so you know that these are not going to cause impingement so whenever you are going to report mri you have to mention these two important findings in your report ligaments has already been covered but what i want to tell you that these are the three most important critical ligaments coraco acromial coraco clavicular and coraco humeral so the coracoid process itself is a very important structure apart from that is the acromial clavicular ligament transverse ligament of humerus and glenohumeral ligaments so just to show you these ligaments quickly uh, this is the coraco acromial that becomes the coraco clavicular and that becomes the coraco humeral so what i want to do is simplify and show you the ligaments they are not seen in one plane you have to go scroll through the images to see them but this is the general orientation and the fourth is the transverse humeral ligament Now everyone has applied importance. We'll get to them one by one. So this case, this case one is actually a constellation of cases. What I want to show you is uh, give you a picture, pictures, uh, pictographic view of what are the various types of labral tears and how you see them. So if you see, this is labrum. You can see below another case with the labral tear. Here we have a labral injury as well as some periosteal sleeve avulsion and there is fluid there. Again, labral degeneration. what is important is if you are not very confident as to whether it is a tear or degeneration you basically mention what uh, that there could be both the options and please most important thing here is to mention what is the location whether it is 12 o'clock 1 o'clock 2 o'clock and if you see these cases again what happens is when there is a labral tear in the acute setting you will be able to see them but as it becomes more and more chronic Uh, the labral tear kind of disappears unless and until you don't do a arthrogram it will not be picked up and then you'll pick up these secondary signs like subarticular uh, erosive cysts and geoid formation the next thing what happens when there is a labral tear is presence of this paralabral cyst and when you see paralabral cyst what is important is to tell what is the location as in this case if you see that is if you consider that it's the right shoulder and this is 12 o'clock this is 6 o'clock this is 3 this is 9 so you have to give exact location of this cyst many times you'll see this paralabral cyst but you'll not see the tear because tear has already completely sealed off or there is no fluid in the cleft so you'll not see the tear but the moment you see a paralabral cyst there has to be a tear there cannot be a cyst without a tear this is to show evidence of rotator cuff injury so we come to the point where uh, Uh, we are talking about rotator rotator cuff and what you see here is this is the footprint of the rotator cuff supraspinatus tendon on the coronal view this is the area which is diseased you can clearly see the signal change that's the muscular tendinous junction and then the muscle now what has happened here is if you see the 
fibers here. You can divide them into three fibers, the articular fibers, the intra-substance area, as well as the bursal aspect. And what you see here in this case is the irregularity and fraying of the bursal fibers. So your report in this case should mention that there is fraying irregularity of the bursal fibers and there could be a partial thickness tear along the bursal surface. And this is something which you may not be able to pick it up on ultrasound. This is what is something which you'll see on ultrasound that there is some tendinosis. But confidently you cannot say it is a tear. And that is one of the fallacies of ultrasound. This we already seen. This is to show a large paralibral cyst which is going below and in, uh, it is in a 6 o'clock position and probably the tear is somewhere at 5 o'clock position. Now presence of cyst means it can cause compression and compression means it can cause suprascapular nerve compression and therefore the most important thing is not only look for the cyst but look for any denervation edema in the muscles. So that is an applied importance of looking for paralibral cyst. And in your report, your impression should mention that there is no evidence of denervation edema in the muscles. Again, these are the paralibral cysts. We've seen many of them. Now, this is just to show you whether this is diseased or normal. Now, look at this patient. This has a, if you see skeleton, it is an immature skeleton. Uh, and in such an immature skeleton, when you see signal extending right up to the footprint of the supraspinatus, that means it is nothing else but a fleshy insertion of the supraspinatus. As of now, there is not significant changes into the tendinous nature of this. So as the patient ages, this keeps on migrating proximally and it becomes less and less fleshy. So this should not be labeled as pathological. So you have to be very careful, especially in the immature skeleton. So what is this case? Case number eight you hardly see any rotator cuff tendon. It is completely edematous, turgid, filled with fluid, even up to right up to the footprint. And you can see that there is some laxity in the muscular tendon in the junction. And there is some retraction as well. So this is almost like a full thickness tear. And what you see here is, this is the bursa. And as Sir told in his talk, that the bursa extends quite below. It is seen beyond this point of the greater tuberosity anteriorly as well as posteriorly as well as laterally and you can see that the fluid is tracking right up to the proximal humerus. What is this structure? What I want to show here is important because this is something which can contribute to impingement and this is something which you can also pick it up on ultrasound especially when you're doing the dynamic motion especially when you're angulating the probe and looking and this is a thickened coracoacromial ligament. The coracoacromial ligament has a coracoid component and an acromial component. The acromial component inserts at the undersurface of acromion. Sometimes it can undergo ossification. Sometimes there can be enthesopathies here. And this causes significant reduction in this subacromial space and result in impingement. And in this case also, if you can see, there is acromial impingement causing tendinosis. So here, if you see, this is that ligament creating a little bit of thickening, maybe a subtle indentation. The tendon is diseased. And look at the footprint. So this is a focal tear in the footprint. If you do ultrasound, will you see this tear? Probably you may not. You may only see a little bit of fluid there. You may see a little bit of periarthritis on your ultrasound, but you will not be able to see the tear. But how do you classify this on MRI? You call this as a footprint tear on the MRI. So what is this in this case? This is a full thickness tear of the rotator cuff with proximal retraction of the fibers. So is this enough for the orthopedic surgeon in our MRI reports? No he will ask for more information. So uh, these are just a few of the things which you can also read up later what he asks. So you can either classify the tears using these classification which are standard, which most of the orthopedicians refer to, that's the Cofield and the Bateman, which basically grade the tear as mild, moderate, severe. Cinder tells you what is the type of tear. If it's a partial tear, it's an articular surface, intra-substance or a bursal surface tear. Well, patty is nothing else but tells you about the retraction of the stump. So this is what we call as a stump. So if this stump is located here, it is grade one, patty classification. If the stump goes at this point, it is grade two. While the stump retracts below the level of the acromial and the AC joint, it is severe retraction. Now why we have to do all these things? These are important because if you give this classification, then there is prognostication if the rotator cuff tear surgery has been done. So if you plan a surgery and this patient has a grade three patty, then what's the point of doing the surgery? There is hardly any repair which is going to take place and the patient may not get entire range of motion. Similarly, just to show you a few cases where there is biceps tendon subluxation. 
So what is the applied importance of showing this case? We saw that there is something called as a transverse humeral ligament which bridges across the biceps tendon. Whenever there is a subscapularis tear, partial or complete, there is a high chance of transverse humeral ligament injury and in that situation, the biceps tendon moves out of the groove and lies medially. So that is basically biceps tendon subluxation. Presence of which should help you in, in informing two things that there is either tear of the transverse humeral ligament and associated partial or full thickness tear of the subscapularis. And when does this happen? It can happen not only in trauma but also in inflammatory arthritis. Again, coming back to rotator cuff tears, there are again two important signs. So we saw the classification, Bateman classification, Cofield classification, Cinder classification and Patty. There are two more classification systems and that is talks about the occupancy ratio by Thomas Yu and fatty replacement by Goodalier. Now again very important, just these are the only five things. They may sound a little bit too much but these are only these five things which you need to remember when you report MRI. You see a rotator cuff tear, you are given everything in your report but if you don't mention whether the supraspinatus muscle bulk is normal or abnormal, you have not done justice to that MRI report. The orthopedic surgeon is going to send the patient back to you because he wants to know whether tear was acute or not. So if there is an acute tear, the muscle will maintain its mass. The muscle will not show fatty atrophy. So in this case, if you see, this entire muscle is showing fatty atrophy. The muscle mass and bulk has reduced. Not only supraspinatus, even the infraspinatus, uh, sorry, the infraspinatus, it is showing muscle mass reduction. It is showing fatty replacement. So that is done by Thomas U classification. Uh, because what we do is calculate the occupancy ratio. Very simple, I don't want to go in the details of how to calculate it. But if you, if you do a simple eyeballing, you know that there is something abnormal. And in fatty replacement, we just see how much fat is there in the muscles. This is just to show you subscap tendinosis. It's very severe, the tendon is very edematous, easily picked up on ultrasound and correlates very well. This is to show you what happens when there are these osteophytes and spurs in the groove they can impinge upon the biceps tendon and they can create such signal within the biceps. They can split the biceps tendon into two and when you see this sign, be very careful to look at the biceps very well in the groove because it's at this particular point that there can be osteophytes which can compress it. And the same biceps tendon in the actual image, if you can see, there is this signal within it. Adhesive capsulitis we all discussed very well. We saw adhesive capsulitis examples, we saw where exactly we have to see. Pathological cases, we see, I see adhesive capsulitis at two places, at the rotator interval. What is the rotator interval? Where the biceps tendon divides, subscap from the supraspinatus. So that's point one where I will see whether there is adhesive capsulitis. Second reason, region is in the inferior joint capsule. In the inferior joint capsule, if I see such inflammation, such thickening, such edema, I know that I am dealing with adhesive capsulitis. What is one of the important features is patient may have limited abduction or no abduction motion. Second thing what you can do is you can give contrast. This may enhance to 2 or 3 mm in thickness. So these are the things which we have to see in adhesive capsulitis. So what is this as in this case 15? If you see in my report what I will mention in this case, intact articular surface, diseased intrasubstance, fraying bursal surface. So most likely partial thickness tear of bursal surface associated bursitis associated AC arthropathy. So that's how a report should mention in detail what you are looking in the tendon. So just to show you a few diseased labrums again. Now this is a case of, what is this thing? Is it a loose body? This is not a loose body. This is the actual view of a subluxated biceps tendon which has moved from here and lying medially. Is it normal? No. It is edematous. It is diseased. Is the subscap seen? It is not seen, completely torn. So this is what happens when there is trauma or inflammatory arthropathies. Actual view. These are some things which we commonly see, GT avulsion fracture. You may also need to do CT in this case to measure the bone fragment and to see how much is the displacement. AC joint dis disruption. It's in these cases where we need to do both CT and MRI. This is the normal side. In the abnormal, if you see, there's a huge gap and there's complete disruption of the coracoacromial ligaments. And coracoacromial ligaments has two parts, conoid as well as trapezoid. 
Now, uh, humerus is one thing which can be affected also by various systemic diseases. Like in this case, what we see is metastatic deposits. So, sometimes there can be confusion whether this is a primary or a metastasis. So, that was a metastasis, but this is a primary bone tumor, like a, some cartilage containing, which can also affect the humerus. So, we need to be careful in evaluating. There can be something called caries sicca. You have heard caries sicca is dry tuberculosis. We see tuberculosis everywhere in the body. We see it also in the hip. Sometimes it can involve the shoulder as well. Though we can call it even avian, but also a differential diagnosis of caries sicca should be considered. Again, just moving to the scapula, just one of the few last images. Scapula is one thing which we can, we have to be very careful while evaluating the humerus because we are not looking at the shoulder per se only as the humerus and the glenohumeral joint. We have the acromioclavicular joint and we have the scapulothoracic linkage. So all these things constitute what is the shoulder joint. So our report will never be complete unless we talk about the scapula. Many times we have scapular lesions which can be completely hidden and masked even on x-rays. Like in this case, what we see is uh, osteochondral lesion. We know it's a flat, flat bone osteochondroma. But we have seen when we do a sequential follow-up, these patients, they definitely turn towards malignancy. And what is important is of doing an MRI in this case is to assess the cart cartilage cap. So why we do MRI is not to know whether this lesion is there or not, but what is the cartilage cap thickness. Anything above 1 centimeter, 1.5 centimeter is worrisome and we need to definitely raise possibility of this can show malignant transformation and biopsy from the cartilage cap adjacent area of the bone is must. Again, systemic lesions which can affect the humerus and proximal shoulder are simple bone cysts like this which can show with pathological fracture and that's the CT image of the same. Now, the important thing is whenever patient comes post-operative, like at, in my institute at least in where I'm working in Sancheti, uh, what happens is if I tell my orthopedic surgeon that uh, patient is post-operative and I will not do an MRI, they may not accept it. Because even if patient is post-operative, there are many things which we can pick up on the MRI. Like in this case, they may need answers not exactly where you want, but some at some different place. So we technically cannot refuse any patient for MRI, even if he has an implant. As in this case, if you see there's a huge shadow which is created. But then if you see, there are many other areas which we can carefully evaluate. And the surgeon may ask you for certain findings beyond that area. So before saying no, at least give it a try. Similarly, in this case, if you see there's a huge plating which has been done in this humerus, but you can still identify and comment upon the rotator cuff tendons. So again, before saying no, at least give it a try before saying no. So the take home message is, if you see rotator cuff injuries, classification is must. Use this Cofield, Batman classifications, Patty, Cinder classification, Thomas U ratio, and uh, uh, Guttalia classification, just five things in your report. Uh, nothing complicated about it. Try to define and be as specific as possible in a report to when you describe a tear. Footprint tear, muscular tendinous junction tear, or bursal surface, intrasubstance, or the articular surface. Give the size wherever possible and concentrate on the main picture first. So if you are seeing a tear, that should be your first line in the report. Other things like bursitis and tendinosis and everything, AC arthropathy can come next. If you see tear and you feel that impingement is a cause of tear, that should again come as the primary line in your report that this is tear most likely secondary to impingement. Why? Because thicken, thickening of the AC ligament or whatever you want to mention in the report. So that should come as the first line and then secondary findings should summarize the rest of the reports. So I think that should conclude my talk. In the foot, it is reversed. It's tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum and then flexor hallucis. So just remember this thing, don't forget this because uh, this is very crucial while labeling them. So first my focus will be to identify the tibialis posterior. And that is where I have identified the tibialis posterior. Can you clearly identify this? Next to this, what will be this then? Digitorum. And then next to it will be the, it is in fact more fleshy and more the tendon is actually low down. What you see is mostly a muscle in this area. As I go down, I'll be able to see the tendon. So what I'll do is first make, first I'll make the probe 
longitudinal. So I see the long axis of the tendoaculus. Okay, can you see the long axis of tendoaculus? Actually, तुम चाहे कहे तो थोड़ा dark करा दो। तीते पर वेगर दिस्ते थे। Because माजा कड़े तो मैं full dark किला। So that's the ten, uh, that's the tibialis posterior. So I am going to try to trace it right up to the insertion, and that's where I can see on the medial aspect of the navicular bone. I can see it fanning out. So that's the tibialis posterior fanning out, and then I again go back and see it posterior to the tibia in the groove. So the first thing I'm going to see is whether there is tenosynovitis, which is not there, whether there is tendinosis. Which again is not there, all clear at this point. Same thing I will do for the extensor digitorum and see if there is any abnormality. And again, I will make the probe longitudinal along its axis, and I can completely trace it as it goes deep in the foot till the point it's visible to me. So that's you can see it's quite though it's going quite deep. I can still very confidently see the tendon. So my attention to them at the moment is very cursory because I know the patient is not having any problem to his legs attendants. He is having no problem to the extensor. But I will focus and go that deep, provided that I know that in this case the patient has some problem there. So then my attention will completely focus on those tendons. So that's about this tendon. The third will be the flexor. Digitorum. Uh, so, it's so a flexor hallucis. So, that's more ecogenic structure. Can you see this thing? And how to identify it? Very easy. I have seen that the vascular bundle is situated in between. I can identify the tibial artery here. And then next to it is this structure. And again, make my probe longitudinal so that I trace it along the axis as it goes in the foot. So, this way I have identified all the three tendons on the posterior medial aspect. And that covers most of my medial aspect. Now, what remains is the deltoid ligament. So, before that, I'll just try to show you the tarsal tun uh, the tunnel here, the uh, medial retinaculum. So, this is at the point of the lowermost extent of the medial malleolus. I'm going to try to identify what will be there as the retinaculum. So, this will be a very thin hypoechoic line which will be stretching across this area. And my probe is completely oblique in location. And what I'm identifying is the retinaculum. So this is a tunnel below which all these structures pass. So this is again clear. Now I know the posterior medial side is clear. Then I go inferiorly. Before that, I'll just try to show where exactly I look for the ligament. So there are two uh, two things actually. Even on the lateral side, I have to show that to you. Is where are the component of the deltoid ligament and the calcaneofibular ligament? So it's pretty easy that way just to know what is the anatomical location of the ligament. So first job is to identify the anatomical location. For that you need to know ligament is a deeper structure. Then will be the tendons, then will be the skin and the subcutaneous tissue and the skin. So the first thing I'll do is identify the lateral malle medial malleolus. So that's the lowermost extent I can see. And then what, what remains is the medial side is part of the talus I'm able to see. And then part of the calcaneum. So these are the three bones, one, two, and three. I'm going to try to identify if I see any structure deep, which represents or looks like a ligament. And if you see this structure, can you see this band? Are you able to appreciate it? Should I change the gain more? So if you are able to identify it confidently up to this part, beyond it, it kind of thins out. And this usually happens. Uh, they are quite difficult to demonstrate, but the fact that you're able to see them in this case is very nice that I'm at least able to demonstrate part of it. So this is just one of the component of the anterior aspect of the anterior limb of the deltoid. So beyond that, I don't expect much from ultrasound. And if you are able to talk or mention something about that, that is really great. And same is the calcaneum fibular. For that, again, only I have to identify the lower end of the calcaneum, which I have, uh, of the, sorry, fibula, which is here, and part of the calcaneum. And I can try to see if I'm able to demonstrate any structure which is connecting them on the lateral aspect. And if you see, 
it's again going to be the deeper structure. It will be about beyond that will be the peroneal tendon. So a structure which is deep to the peroneal tendon is my area of interest. So I'm trying to identify that. And calcaneal fibular ligament could be a little bit difficult to demonstrate, but it is possible. So that's the point where I'm seeing the cal uh, fibula nearest to the calcaneum. And in this region, deep to the peroneal tendon will be the thickened ligament if it is idiomatous or abnormal. And that's the location which you should try to achieve or obtain when you're doing an ankle ultrasound. So we saw anterior approach, we saw medial approach, we saw the lateral approach, we saw the diseased tendoaculus. Let's quickly move to the plantar aspect and see the plantar fascia, especially at the calcaneal insertion. So again, it depends upon the thickness. And in this case, if you see, I'm just, uh, as there's a lot of callosities on the leg. He's a kind of a farmer. Probably he's been walking on uh, barefoot. And with such, ideally, in fact, it's very nicely seen. Means I have seen patients where it is, the moment you keep your probe, you see it. But unfortunately, he's not the right candidate because of thick callosities covering the entire sole of feet. So let's try if I use a little bit of pressure and try to displace little bit. So I'm getting some view. Are you able to see it? Yes. So some pressure, lot of pressure in fact. Yeah. Is it okay? Is this okay? So that's the calcaneum. That's the plantar fascia. And that's the insertion on the calcaneum. And you can trace it as it goes anteriorly. And it is at this point where you see it at, at its thickest, you should take the thickness. And you can also document it by doing a dual and comparing the same with the opposite side. So this is especially important to remove a bias. And when you are not sure whether you are dealing with plantar fasciitis, with patient who has a classical symptom of plantar fasciitis. So in that situation, go to the opposite side and demonstrate. So you can see it's both very well seen. Ecogenicity is almost normal. Thickness is almost normal. Little bit here and there is possible, but it's completely normal. And I, second thing what is important is look for the presence of a spur. So there will be a prominent bony plantar calcaneal spur, which you see on x-rays, which you always report. And if it's there, it will be definitely seen. It's exactly at this location. And in this case, luckily, we don't have one. So I think uh, that should be more than sufficient. If you are able to demonstrate all of these structures, you have done a successful ankle ultrasound. Uh, I usually uh, also show the uh, plantar plate. So I'll just try to see if I'm able to demonstrate a little bit here. Because this is one area of interest in sports injuries. How we have a bowler plate, which we saw, uh, we saw there. We also have a plantar plate. Important is if uh, for sports injuries, we have to see this area very carefully. And that's the sesamoid bones. These are the two sesamoid bones. And try to identify the metatarsophalangeal joint space. And that's where the space is there. And there's a flexor tendon, which is going just above it. Can you see the tendon? Very nicely. It goes between the two sesamoid bones. Uh, this is for the flexor hallucis. And if there is some irritation which is created by this sesamoid bone, uh, it may show tear or it may show tendinosis. And that's the reason why you have to focus on this area if there is any typical history. And then below that, the deeper structures is the capsule again. That's the capsule, and that's the fat, and that's the joint space. So uh, that's, that's the volar plate. And the first metatarsophalangeal volar plate is the most important to be seen. The rest of them are not significant unless there is history of trauma. But uh, this is the area which is very critical. And you can identify the tendon very nice, healthy, going just anterior to it. So try to at least demonstrate the first metatarsophalangeal <coughs> volar plate and the sesamoid bones. And if you are not sure what you're looking at, always look at the x-ray. And that's the reason why x-ray is very important. And compare with the opposite side. So that's the reason where comparison is a must, especially in the region of the foot. Because sesamoid bones can have variable shapes. So you cannot call it sesamoiditis or something unless and until you see real, real strong signs of inflammation around the sesamoid bone. So 
that covers the ankle exam. If you have any questions, let me know. Sahina, I can